back for some more DST show live here still in the training center for the last two months wondering where it all went wrong COVID-19 went wrong not to televise ratings we have to wait until the summer where a lot of people should be watching and of course we open up with, of course, the biggest thing, Jason Jordan, we saw live on, no, 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 we, Jason Jordan was, was on the opening of the show, but not in an important segment, of course, he looked to be a backstage figure next to uh, Jamie Noble, because there seemed to be a car accident, where it looked like it was framed that Jeff Hardy was inebriated, accidentally crashing into Elias, when Elias looks like he's still in his wrestling apparel that's technically casual wear. But he makes it look like wrestling apparel. Either way, these men were both supposed to be in the tournament. So, uh, Jeff Hardy was taken out for questioning. Seems to be framed. Elias seems to be out of commission during to the car accident. Of course, uh, Renee Young was there. Obviously, policemen targeted Jeff Hardy because he smells just like the alcohol that was in the car. This dragged out for above 15 minutes. We could have went to everything else. We didn't know if Jeff Hardy was leaving or something. They found him all the way in the opposite side of where the car accident should have been. That had to be the most awkward thing ever. To last over 15 minutes of a segment. Another awkward segment had to be Mandy Rose wet dreaming. I.e. wet dreaming over Otis taking a dip. Them sucking face. For several minutes. And I thought, and people thought I was going to watch that. I'm not. So there seems to be this backstage figure. And I've been watching SmackDown and reviewing it for the last several months. Over two years of reviewing. And I barely skip segments. Unless it's completely cringe. So who the hell is this figurehead issuing the missing competitors for the Intercontinental Championship Tournament? They had Ron Strowman there as a bystander, and he was barely important over the course of the match, uh, of the show. Otis didn't reference him when he was in the segment with Mandy. Nobody else seems to target. We didn't even have a promo involving Miz and Morrison until next week on SmackDown. There should be some sort of continuity, especially involving the world champion. It, that, that was completely stupid of a segment. At least they did something to orchestrate this. But they didn't even reference this cheap, morally looking ass douchebag coming around being like, Hey, St thanks for being a contributor. And if AJ Styles wants to buy, that's perfectly fine. Even though he didn't, er he didn't earn going to the finals. But that's perfectly cool. Perfectly cool with you guys. That's cool. Uh, they orchestrated it as this. The guys that were complaining in the middle of the backstage segment over the tournament... They get a shot in a battle royale to see who will face off against Daniel Bryan. So why didn't they have two guys win in battle royales to make it to the semifinals? One could have been Corbin or J or Gable, or the, or the other one could have been Sheamus. And they're somehow pushing one half of the Usos to be a single star for some apparent reason. The other Uso couldn't make it. So either he was in that trade involving AJ Styles or something something. I don't care, to be honest. That's just coming for me. We, of course, have more important news. Uh, we have an NXT call-up. And it is Matt Riddle. After his steel cage match with Timothy Thatcher, his last match, he, of course, had some phenomenal matches, had an unbeaten streak that lasted for, I think, over a year and a half or a year and a quarter. He comes around, I think, beating Timothy Thatcher. He, of course, had memorable matches. Of course, making a cool tag team with Pete Dunne. I, my favorite match with him was against uh, Velveteen Dream for the North American Championship. Uh, at least it's going to build up some sort of personality on the SmackDown roster. Because technically, they barely have anybody that's over. Because they made Elias face. Enough said. Uh... Jeff Hardy has this crappy... It's either I want to see Jeff Hardy heal. Sheamus has nothing to deal with, and there seems to be barely any single stars. I forgot Shorty G was part of the main roster still. I thought he was part of that trade as well for AJ Styles. Because either way, he just ends up beating shit Cesaro because uh, Nakamura and Cesaro costed him the Battle Royale when it was like the Final Four left. 
because the match was going to start right now. After that, we had a segment after the assembly blown off. Styles came around calling Daniel Bryan an idiot because obviously Styles has a buy. He can do anything at this point. He can try to sabotage any of the guys from getting a title shot, injure them, and he's going to be 100% for a majority of the match. So he has all the time in the world. There was a cool, there was a, some cool spots from the Lucha House Party. There, there, there is barely any storytelling other than to just let Shorty G still be the pseudo underdog after the match. That's practically. I don't know why the fuck Shorty G still has these forceful underdog shits, even though it's shown in WWE history. Underdogs kinda are decorated champions. Dolph Ziggler's a decorated champion. Rey Mysterio's a first ballot Hall of Famer. Eddie Guerrero didn't fit the bill until he won the WWE Championship. There's a lot of weirdos that win world titles. And they still reference this to make a borderline, forceful, babyface underdog gimmick that obviously gets heat because it's the most played, dumbass gimmick where it looks like he's wearing Eugene's singlet with neon colors. And it's so dumb. I really hate Shorty G in that aspect. We had, we had the Usos. With the, uh, one half of the Usos, I think it was Jey Uso. Going to a back and forth with the final one being Sheamus. Hitting a super kick off the middle. They start wrestling down the apron. And then a broke kick to toss him out after pushing his shoulder through the ring post. Sheamus ends up becoming the number one contender. Um, and moving up to the semifinals to face off against Daniel Bryan at the main event of SmackDown. What was Braun Strowman doing? Nothing at all, man. I was just coming home from... I was just coming to work. Coming from work and what well, work? Don't you work in the WWE? Literally the biggest wrestling promotion that that exists to this day. So, it's like, what? Is that the most awkward bystanding crap ever? And Braun Strowman was a bystander, even though you know how bland it is when you're a babyface. WWE doesn't know how to make a babyface over, and that's sad. Unless these guys could actually talk. We got rid of Ryback. We got rid of CM Punk. Because we keep bullshitting him, all these guys that have personality, we get rid of. And guess where they go? Streaming. Or AEW, but who's counting? Somehow Drake Maverick still has a contract, I think. <clears throat> so, of course, we had other segments. Involving Lacey Evans against Sonya Deville. Don't know if this came up to a future spot for a women's championship opportunity. Lacey Evans just wrestles her because she's the heel. You nasty. Disrespectful. Little heathen. You harlot. My heavens. This match. Ended in a double count out. And I guess this was supposed to show that this... This rivalry is going to go on for a while. Oh, fuck me. They're probably going to do a lumber gel match or whatever the hell they're going to do to make it feel less like it's still the Divas division or some shit. And I don't care. Because saying put your hair up and square up makes me want to just punch you in the face really hard. We had some back and forth, some moonsault, a kip up. Uh. Tony Deville discriminating over women with blonde hair. Lacey Evans tossing a knocking at her, calling Mandy always better than her, even though she beat her twice at this point. I don't, I don't get that. There were some forearms. They start brawling in their ringside until it was counted as a double countout. Lacey tried to call her back inside the ring until she said she didn't her time. So, uh, I guess they ended in that note. We're probably going to have a rematch next week. We're, we're baby facing another heel is going to get involved. That's probably Tamina and Naomi or something. I don't care. I really don't care. At least we're moving out of the Lacey Evans and Mandy feud. I think that already, uh, that's already been consumed in that aspect. I don't think that it should continue. 
So, uh, if anything, to still give Lacey Evans a program, because she's been borderline irrelevant, I think she only had one match for the women's title. After, you know, she was treated as this huge major heel big shot from NXT. And she's completely been irrelevant since turning face. And we, of course, have the I Hate the New Day. I started loving, I thought, I thought this group was an underrated heel thing, a uh, heel group of just guys thinking that they're being babyface, and now they are babyface, and, uh, it sucks. They're like the most decorated team probably in wrestling history, and, uh, still, to this day, I still can't get that these are grown adults coming around, sneaking around. Dude, well, I understand that these are childlike Negroes just dancing around and shit. And I get this is PG. It just feels so unwatchable. You're trying to play this over to a major league audience. Why do you think most people want to switch to AEW? This is why I don't waste time at NXT, dog. Because I just I just expect the worst from WWE at this point. This, this was corny backstage shit until they transitioned to the New Day. And Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross having their own separate entrances, even though it looked like they were walking together to the ring. Uh, we had coffee beans, and he just tossed water at it. I don't think Biggie Langston knows how brewing works. I mean, it's the same man who still tosses pancakes in his singlet, even though he wrestles. Ah! Start talking about what catches your which team catches your eye the most. Well, the Lucha House Party are jobbers. Miz and Morrison really have been irrelevant with their title reign, and uh, somehow we just forgot about Heavy Machinery because Otis is tag team is now money in the bank. So uh, yeah, uh, let's let's think about the Forgotten Sons. At least you're gonna push one team from uh, NXT, and now Matt Matt Riddle's gonna be part of the case here. Uh, yeah! And these are bad dudes. They start uh, bringing up uh, how dangerous they are from NXT until Bailey and Sasha Banks comes to obviously issue out that there's still a, still a little friendship and I guess they're building up the SummerSlam. To me, dude, I don't care. I don't really care. Bailey has like no heat, heat magnetism. In that aspect, she just plays her role, and she plays it as generic as possible. It ends up after a couple harsh words, and Bailey tossing a jacket to Alexa Bliss. No, that was actually Sasha Banks. That they end up in a bit of a scuffle, disrespecting that Sasha is like has no gold, even though she has more championships than Nikki and Alexa combined. Even though it's in a, even though it's a short span, she still holds more belts. And it ended up with Bailey forcing a match on Sasha, even though she's not even in her ring gear. And it ends up in quick fashion. There was a there was a running meteor, a running meteor from the top, Hurricane Arana. Alexa with of course her knee her double knee drop into a moonsault to a knee drop. It's always a cool move to see until she fucks it up. Nikki kept acting autistic. I guess that was fun because some of my friends just call her thick because she always wears sweatpants or leather pants every time she's in the ring. I don't care at all. She's just so annoying. She had barely any promo experience. Every time I see a Nikki Cross match, it just feels like it's Dana Brooke with less experience. The match was viable for anybody not in her wrestling gear, and pretty much all they changed was she was wearing sneakers instead of high heels. It, uh, it, ended, up, it ended up off a running knee. I, I, it didn't end off the bank statement. Uh, just a running double knee from the turnbuckle. Sasha Banks picks up the win thanks to a Bailey interference with Nikki Cross playing a factor. Sasha, and Sasha, I guess they get a title shot because that was issued for next week on on SmackDown. There was, of course, the Cesaro and Shorty G match. 
I was totally excited in the aspect that I would care about Shorty G pinning somebody legit. And I hate calling him that. I hate calling him Shorty G. He just comes around wearing overalls and shorts other than wrestling gear. And I guess was to build up a forceful factor, like when you're forcing a babyface underdog, he's not really an underdog, in my opinion. That's just how I feel about it. There was, of course, an uppercut, a springboard uppercut, a stiff discus lariat from the ropes. Uh, Cesar was working as stiff as possible. Of course, that rebound into a German suplex. A surprise roll-up for the three after a chain of pinfalls. Shorty G picks up a surprise upset against Cesaro. I don't know how surprised it is that, you know, if Cesaro always has, like, the brink of actually becoming a big upper mid-carder into losing to Jobbers, and that really lowers his stock. I'm calling him Claudio Casanoli. I don't get upon anybody. Match looks forgettable. They're pro he's probably going to have a match against Nakamura. There's no Sami Zayn, so I don't know what the hell's going to happen there. He's probably going to go to Raw. I don't really give a damn. Shorty G's bland as hell. There, there's no point. There's practically no point in watching that match. Other than if you're a fan of both of their wrestling styles, I guess. I already discussed over the Otis Mandy segment that I thought it was just fucking gross. Somehow there was, like, rain and shit. Man uh, Otis came... With his stomach stretch marks and shit. With the rain, even though it's literally sunlight. He seemed to be in an indoor pool. So that was... It was awkward. It was supposed to be hilarious. It was the most cringe part of the night. Kurt Angle put over Edge and Randy Orton before introducing Matt Riddle into the SmackDown roster. And... Yeah... Uh, I mean, he both wrestled them, so I guess that was much. I, I, my opinion on Matt Riddle, I think he's a tremendous talent. I already discussed my favorite matches with him. I'm not going to dismay that he, like, he isn't, like, talented. I think, like, he talks a lot of shit, and he can be a cancer, depending on the professional roster that he's dealing with. Thanks, he's at a higher tier than he was on NXT. Uh, but if he gets those dream matches that he has with, uh, no, Lesnar or Goldberg. I, I guess that's something that he would want. Thanks, he's been talking all this shit. All he does is bicycle knees, in my opinion. I feel like he has very little any promo ability involved the in, instead of the NXT style. I know it's just going to be bland. And we're going to have a match right now, bro. He's just going to do his dumb signature catchphrase. And it's... I'm just expecting the worst, because every NXT call-up just ends up sad, in my opinion. The only person to have pseudo-success is technically Kevin Owens, because he's still on the main roster. So Finn Balor was supposed to be a close second until he literally came from a Universal Champion, an Intercontinental Champion, into he's back on NXT. Next up was the main event. And it's a shocker, because Drew Gulak was on the Battle Royale. But, even though it was reported that he was released. So, I don't know about that. Probably it's a multi-day clause until he's gone. So, Seamus against Daniel Bryan. And it ended off a pinfall after Jeff, Cardi Jeff Hardy came and interfered. So, Daniel Bryan has AJ Styles in the finals for the Intercontinental title tournament. Uh, Irish Curse... Beat up. I've seen these guys wrestle multiple times on Raw, SmackDown, and even for the World Heavyweight title, even though it ended in 18 seconds. It was as much as you can give it. It's literally the same match that he had with Jeff Hardy, other than some more bicycle knees, a running knee of the midsection. It was, it was literally boring. A double axe handle. It looked impactful, but you forget Daniel Bryan is small, so he has to sell it as well as possible. A bro kick, but Jeff Hardy came around and stopped Sheamus. A running knee came out of nowhere. Daniel Bryan picked up the surprise victory. That's how the match ended. 
And you see how uh, you, f you feel my enthusiasm going into this review, and you can see that I want to kill myself. But the problem is, uh, YouTube doesn't pay me, so, I'm, <clears throat> for obvious reasons, I'm obviously not the, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big channel, so, yeah. But, uh, there is barely anything impactful. They didn't go further on to the car accident. Baron Corbin wasn't in any shape or form involved. Like, none of the top guys. They didn't go into a asking uh, Elias. They're obviously trying to tease for a reason to watch next week on SmackDown. We don't know the executive of of SmackDown. We had a dumb promo by the Forgotten Sons that, act that acted like it was a debut to NXT, not SmackDown. Because they are bland, and the only thing that we know about them is their former Marines. I, I just thought this episode of SmackDown was really bland. One of the matches I actually liked, and uh, I just felt like they were not doing their, uh, doing, uh, their damnness to actually build up. We're probably going to just have a tag team. We're, we're probably just going to have Alexa or something against Bailey for the women's title. Like, nothing to build up. They're not even trying to build up the Intercontinental title match for the finals on Backlash. Or something like that. SmackDown has no selling point because they have barely any top stars. The Fiend barely even made an appearance. After he literally lost a universal title. And he didn't even show himself again. All we had was like a simple threat. A small reference to the Fiend from The Miz. That was practically it. Like, they do no, no storytelling. They're literally making him a pseudo part timer. Congratulations to the kid, though, Bray. So I can understand why they're not showing him on TV. But that's practically all I had to say about this. This gets a four out of ten. The SmackDown was disappointing. They already have low all time ratings. It's bullshit. While like Double or Nothing's doing multi like big buys on pay per view. And that's a big thing, even coming from the pandemic. And how many people have to sit down and watch? And obviously for major reasons, because of how much, uh, you know, AEW actually wants to give you reasons and build up for big shows like that. WWE does not. And they're dying, and they're drying out of money because of the failure of a football league. Sadly, it wasn't their fault. But they keep trying to fucking punch that wound to feel like it's getting better. And, uh... They're depleting wrestling wrestlers, even though they're the biggest wrestling fed of, in the century. So I don't know why they're firing these dudes. And then, you know, they're full of half-truths in half-assed television. So that's all I have to bring here. Like, comment, subscribe on how you feel about SmackDown. That's coming from the DST show. Like, comment, and subscribe if you want more. And help me get to 30 subs and more. That's a coming from me.